welcome to Telesur English. I am Estefania Bravo in Quito, Ecuador. This is From the South. The president of Venezuela spoke to the media on Monday to announce new measures to face possible cases of the COVID-19 virus in the Bolivarian nation. Among the measures, the president declared a permanent health emergency and suspended all flights coming in from Colombia and Europe starting on March 15th. The health system of Venezuela, I have decided to declare it in permanent emergency state. So we can prevent and protect and to be prepared in all its capacities to attend all of the cases that may be uh, detected in any, any corner of the country. We have taken all of the provisions possible. I have to say this, is, this would be a good moment to demand President Donald Trump to lift the criminal sanctions against Venezuela so Venezuela can go out to the market and buy everything that we need to confront the situation. We, uh, it costs like the triple everything we need to buy, like the tests, the diagnosis tests, but we've been able to get them. In Brazil, authorities from the Presidential Health Service announced they are working to secure all workers from the possible spread of the COVID-19 after a top official tested positive. As posted on his social media, Jair Bolsonaro's press secretary was part of a delegation that traveled just days ago with the president to Florida. They met U.S. President Donald Trump for a reception at his Mar-a-Lago resort with other members of the U.S. government. Juan Garten initially denied a report that he had been and tested and said his health was fine, but is now in self-quarantine. For their part, Bolivia's de facto government has suspended all flights from and to Europe and ordered all schools be closed in order to contain the spread of the novel coronavirus. This decision comes as another Latin American countries like Ecuador, Argentina, Colombia and Peru have announced they will isolate travelers arriving from high-risk zones. Guyana also confirmed its first imported case of COVID-19 in Georgetown. The patient has been identified as a 52-year-old Guyanese female who had traveled from the United States. She arrived in the country on the 5th of March, presented to the public health system on 10th of March, and was found to have uncontrolled diabetes and hypertension. She subsequently died at the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation at 0800 hours on the 11th of March. Health professionals sought to conduct tests for COVID-19 based on the patient's travel history. A clinical sample was collected and sent at 10 hours on the 11th of March to the National Reference Laboratory, where laboratory tests confirmed the diagnosis at approximately 17 hours. In Cuba, three people have tested positive for the virus. Four Italian tourists entered the island, and three of them were confirmed positive, having shown respiratory symptoms. They are all isolated in the Pedro Couri Medical Institute in Havana. St. Vincent and the Grandines also recorded its first case. It is a woman returning home from the United Kingdom. It becomes the third care combination to report a coronavirus case. Martinique has four, Jamaica two, the Dominican Republic five, St. Bart and St. Martin three. We've received confirmation earlier today that St. Vincent and the Grenadines has recorded its first case of COVID-19. It is what is described in the literature as an imported case. The disease appeared in a Vincentian female who had traveled abroad to the United Kingdom, otherwise known as England, which is known to have cases of COVID-19 and returned home on March 7, 2020. The president of El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, has declared a quarantine for the whole country in an effort to avoid any COVID-19 cases. 
That is why, looking into the reflection of other countries, like Italy, China, South Korea, like an, an entire zone in New York that is already in quarantine, we have decided to declare quarantine for the entire national territory. And over in Europe, Spain's Podemos party leader Pablo Iglesias has said he will self-quarantine at his home while he's being tested for the virus after fellow party member, Minister of Equality and wife Irene Montero tested positive. In the following hours, tests will be carried out on other members of the government. Meanwhile, in China, new cases of the COVID-19 continue to fall. And as on Thursday, for the first time, they dropped to single-digit numbers. But the United States has continued to lobby attacks at the Asian giant in what Chinese authorities say are attempts at, at hiding their own failures in responding to the pandemic. A team of experts from the World Health Organization, including American experts, came to China for a nine-day visit recently and spoke highly of the transparency of information China has shown in its fight against the epidemic. I will not comment on whether the U.S. response to the outbreak is open and transparent. However, it is clear that some U.S. officials have turned a blind eye to the high praise given by the international community to China. It is China's forceful measures and Chinese people's huge sacrifice that stemmed the outward spread of COVID-19, thus vying valuable time for the world to respond. According to whose recent statement, countries like Singapore and the Republic of Korea took necessary measures and put the epidemics under control because they made full use of this precious time China bought for the world. As for whether the U.S. availed itself of this window to enhance preparedness, we do not comment. But I believe the fact is witnessed by all in America and across the globe. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Chair of the Caribbean Community and Barbadian Prime Minister Mia Motley urged the Guyana Elections Commission to strictly adhere to Wednesday's High Court ruling. At a press conference on Thursday, Prime Minister Motley stressed that Chief Justice Roxanne George was clear in her ruling that she expects the returning officer to either start a new or complete the vote counting process in Region 4. The CARICOM chair also led a delegation comprising of regional leaders on a two-day visit to Guyana. The Chief Justice of Guyana ruled yesterday and her ruling was absolutely clear that she expects the returning officer to either start a new or complete the process with respect to the SOPs. And we hope and pray that there will be an adherence to the not just the law of the judgment but to the spirit of the judgment because she was very clear in the last few paragraphs of her judgment as to what she expected in terms of the spirit and the principled position and the transparent process that is critical if this country is to go forward. Various worker unions in Ecuador have rejected recent austerity measures presented by the government of Lenin Moreno, who said these are necessary to face a drop in oil prices and fears caused by the COVID-19 outbreak. Nonetheless, workers say that these measures only serve to justify more layoffs in the public sector. The fall in the price of oil and the COVID-19 virus are the reasons the government of Ecuador used to announce new austerity measures. Among them, President Moreno called for massive layoffs, new taxes and new loan requests. We will make a budget cut of $1.4 billion, out of which $100 million will be in goods and services, and $600 million in capital. Health service will be not affected. We will eliminate the youth ministry, four regulation and control agencies, three institutes, three public enterprises, four technical offices and the public media company.
to these empresas públicas. The reactions to the announcements have been many. For the United Workers Front, the government violated Article 328 of the Constitution when it announced the reduction of worker salaries. They also rejected the neoliberal economic model imposed by the government. To close public companies means more layoffs. It means that thousands of Ecuadorians will not have an income. They are also want to apply a new taxes on people's salaries which is inconstitutional. Economic analysts say that working under the belief that the size of the state is the problem, the government has implemented the wrong measures directly affecting citizens. They also say that the government has continued to benefit the banking and the business sector. The middle class is the one that's most affected. I wonder, where are those who benefited from the 4.6 billion tax adjustment? A system that reached record profits in 2019 when the country's economy was swooping. That means that those who benefited most from this perverse model are not those who will pay the costs to support the government until the end of its period. Despite the fact that the government called these measures a positive step, as according to them they will bring $2.2 billion in income to the state, hundreds of Ecuadorians will be left without a job. Such is the case in the state media services, where 651 people are to be laid off, and a number of outlets will be shut down. Moving on, a fire which set ablaze one of the primary warehouses of Venezuela's National Electoral Council was intentionally set, according to Interior Minister Nestor Reverol. Reverol said that a multidisciplinary team would be appointed, headed by the Scientific and Criminal Investigations body, to investigate what they have deemed a terrorist attack. Storage sheds which were burned in the fire on Saturday housed tens of thousands of voting machines, hundreds of civil registry computers as well as electronic ballot machines and biometric fingerprint identification systems. It was carried out intentionally against an area of more than 6,000 meters, which caused the total destruction of blocks of over 1,400 square meters. And with that, the destruction of 49,000 voting machines and different identification systems, as well as other components, given that this was a technological park. In the investigation, they located three points of ignition of the fire. They were located in the perimeter of the storage warehouse, which were set at distinct points around the warehouse and were initiated with the use of flammable accelerants. That is, it was sprayed with ignitable fuel. Additionally, two receptacles were located with gas residue. Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro celebrated the fourth anniversary of the creation of the local food supply and production committee's CLAP, a subsidized food delivery program to help all Venezuelans, which has been targeted by U.S. sanctions. Let's take a look. Boxes are stored and distributed from this point, with food delivered at subsidized prices by the Venezuelan state. This humanitarian program has become the target of recent sanctions imposed by the White House. The local food supply and production committees are a food distribution system that provides basic products to over 6 million families for the cost of about half a dollar. It was created in 2016 to fight food shortages created by contraband and price speculation. There is rice, beans, pasta, sugar, milk, sometimes tuna, sauce or mayonnaise. But the radical opposition says this is a mechanism of social control, an idea parroted by the UN's High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet. But for the communities that benefit, the CLAPs are a model of social organization and fraternity. First, we conduct a census so we can be clear on how many families we have. Then we have a purchase date and a delivery date. We follow a detailed schedule. Each week, I meet with the women who organize CLAPs, who represent different organizations. In 2019, the United States applied sanctions to 10 out of 12 ships transporting food to Venezuela, something the government denounced as economic terrorism. But the people have taken to the streets several times to defend the program. The blockade is affecting us because medicine is not arriving. They have blocked our money abroad. We know they want our resources. 
Los CLAP fueron creados en 2000. People know CLAPs were created to protect the population from the effects of a criminal economic war. Si boicotean el CLAP. If they manage to stop the collapse, we have to come up with an alternative, because for the price of one box, we can't even buy one of the products in stores. We will be in need. In the face of uncertainty, people turn to organization. In the face of frustration, they resist. Leonel Retamal Muñoz, Telesur Caracas, Venezuela. Students in Chile face repression by riot police in Santiago on the second anniversary of the mandate of President Sebastián Piñera. The day also marked the 30th anniversary of the return of democracy to Chile following the Augusto Pinochet dictatorship. Demonstrations took place in front of the National Institute and near the Presidential Palace. Most of the public transportation in Central Santiago was suspended due to the protests. Before, we protested in Plaza Italia and they practically didn't pay any attention to us. Now we're here, Piñera hasn't got much time left in power. If he doesn't leave on good terms, he'll have to leave the hard way. Sebastián Piñera has questioned other Latin American presidents about the chaos they have in their countries. And he has the biggest chaos right now in Latin America. And Piñera should resign. In Brazil, new revelations on the Lava Jato corruption investigations are now surfacing. Brian Muir has more. Whenever you see a regime change operation in Latin America, you have to ask who benefits from it. And everyone knows that who benefited the most from the 2016 parliamentary coup in Brazil were American corporations like ExxonMobil, Chevron, Microsoft, and Boeing, which benefited from the massive wave of privatizations which took place after the coup. Now, a bombastic series of revelations published in The Intercept in partnership with the Brazilian independent media company Apublica today reveals that the Lava Jato or Operation Car Wash Task Force was illegally collaborating with the U.S. Department of Justice since at least 2014. Now, the fact that it was a joint operation has been public information for a long time, but what these new revelations reveal are leaked social media conversations on the Telegram app showing that Dalton Dalignol and other Lava Jato Task Force members knew that they were violating Brazilian law in their dealings with the U.S. Department of Justice. According to Brazilian law, according to a bilateral treaty with the United States in 1998, it's illegal for government officials to communicate informally with government officials from a foreign country. But this is exactly what the Lavo Jato Task Force was doing with the U.S. Department of Justice. Furthermore, it shows that U.S. DOJ officials started coming down and visiting them in Curitiba as early as 2014. And one of the officials who was involved in this is Patrick Stokes, who's the villain of Sidney Powell's book, License to Lie, which is about corrupt practices in the US Department of Justice. So what this reveals really is the dirty hand of the United States in the 2016 coup, which removed Dilma Rousseff from office illegally, and in former President Luis Inacio Lula da Silva's political imprisonment on frivolous charges and his removal from the 2018 presidential elections, which led to the election of far-right Jair Bolsonaro. We thank our correspondent Brian Muir for that report. Let's take a short break now, but don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. A U.S. judge has ordered the immediate release of a former intelligence analyst Chelsea Manning from prison. The order comes just a day after Manning attempted suicide inside the Alexandria Detention Center in Virginia. Scheduled, she was scheduled to appear in court on Friday, but the judge ruled that it was no longer necessary for her to testify. Manning was the U.S. Army intelligence analyst who provided WikiLeaks with the Iraq and Afghanistan war logs in 2010, for which she was convicted under the Espionage Act. Russia will participate in the upcoming technical meeting of the OPEC Plus countries. Our correspondent, Lisandra Andres from Moscow, has the details. Russia's Energy Minister Alexander Novik has announced that Russia will participate in the next meeting of the OPEC Plus Technical Committee, which is scheduled for March 18th. Novik said that authorities of oil-producing countries are closely monitoring the COVID-19 outbreak, which has led to a sharp drop in oil prices. 
In an earlier meeting on March 6th, OPEC plus ministers couldn't agree on a deal to reduce oil production. The main OPEC nations proposed to further reduce oil production by 1.5 million barrels per day until the end of the year. But Russia didn't agree with this proposal, instead suggesting to keep the current restrictions, which would have expired in April, in place until the end of the year to see how the coronavirus outbreak will play out and what its impact on the oil market and the world economy will be. However, OPEC plus nations couldn't reach an agreement during the meeting last week and called for a new one to be held on March 18th. Russia's finance minister said that as long as the price of oil stays between $25 and $30 per barrel, the Russian government can guarantee economic security for the country for the next six to ten years. Meanwhile, the energy minister announced plans to the Federation Council to modernize the energy sector and expand its main infrastructure until 2024. Russian lawmakers have approved a package of constitutional amendments proposed by President Vladimir Putin, which include giving new powers to the parliament and stricter background checks on top officials. The bill will be sent to regional parliaments for their consideration, where it must be supported by at least two-thirds. If it passes, the Federation Council or Upper House is set to meet again on Saturday to approve the bill. President Putin must forward the proposed changes to the constitutional court, which will have seven days to decide whether or not they are in accordance with Russia's law. If the court greenlights the bill, it's scheduled to be put to a nationwide vote on April 22nd. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has accused Greek security forces of behaving like Nazis for using force against migrants and refugees trying to cross the border from Turkey. Greek security forces have used tear gas and water cannon to stop people from entering. Turkey has previously accused them of shooting four people dead, a claim rejected by Athens as, quote, fake news. Greece has suspended asylum applications for a month and said it prevented more than 42,000 migrants and refugees entering the EU over the past two weeks. Until all Turkey's expectations, including free movement, the opening of chapters, updating of the customs union and financial assistance are tangible met, we will continue to practice on our borders. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.